Welcome to BreezeLine, where the sky's the limit thanks to better internet. With lightning fast speeds up to one gig, you can game like a boss, stream like a pro, and watch like there's no tomorrow. Stream, watch, post, send, and trend. Do it all with our fiber-powered network, bringing you reliable, fast internet. Welcome to BreezeLine. Visit BreezeLine.com for latest offers. Service subject to availability. New customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for details. Welcome to episode 189 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Liam Warren, Natalie Bishop, Babathy Brown, Giselle Flores, Heath Manzano, Ruth Dobson, Jackie, Mamie May, Stevie Axelson, Courtney Boudry, Sarah Hines, Lauren Losh, Teresa Wilson, Amy Banks, Emily May Johnson, Danny Green, Jackie Spencer, Kate Avery, Wendy Harris and Molly the Travel Nurse. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And just to say as a bit of an admin note, I think we're pretty basically up to date on Patreon as of the 21st of February 2023. So if you signed up to Patreon after the 21st of February 2023. Don't worry, your name will still be called out. If you signed up to the Patreon before the 21st of February 2023, at this particular point in time, and you've not yet heard your name, please do let me know, because sometimes I do just miss them. They slip through the cracks. It happens every so often. So do just drop me an email if you haven't heard your name. And our film review this week. Our film review is Creep. Creep was released in 2004. It has 5.6 out of 10 on IMDb and 40% on Rotten Tomatoes. Party-loving Kate wakes up in a London tube station to find the place locked up and deserted. With no choice but to stay there until morning, Kate soon finds that some things are much more frightening than being alone as she heads into the labyrinth of tunnels beneath the city pursued by an unknown attacker. So as per usual, I'm going to do the likes and the dislikes for this movie. And I want to start by saying this is a bloody great premise for a film. Bring on more horror films that are based around the London underground. Like the London underground can be just fundamentally scary sometimes, right? We've done a whole episode on how it's desperately haunted. But also if you've been on the underground like late at night or been on the underground really, really early in the morning when it's relatively deserted and it's only you and maybe a couple of other people on the platform or you and maybe a couple of other people on a particular train. Like, it can be scary. And I've had some incidents on the London Underground with drunk people late at night. Like, it can be a pretty scary place. So I really appreciated the kind of simplicity of how freaky it can be to be on any sort of underground train line late at night and making your way home from a night out on your own is also scary like that can be pretty frightening at times and I felt like the setting of being trapped on the underground when it is dark and late you can't get out it's completely deserted nobody's around it was honestly a great claustrophobic setting for the film itself and I really enjoyed it because I was thinking when I was watching it what would I do if I'm I'm you know I wake up on the platform and suddenly realize the place is completely deserted how would I try and get out I don't know what I would do and I was really unnerved by the opening sequence of the film when she realizes she's on her own but she's not on her own and actually the person with her is somebody that she knows and who doesn't have good intentions towards her like I found that really frightening it really scared me and that is a very real situation that people find themselves in and it created this sense of ambiguity that I kind of enjoyed 
You know, I I have to say, like at times during this film, I really enjoyed the ambiguity. That becomes a bit double-edged, which I'll talk about later. But like, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't really know who the antagonist was. I didn't really know where the film was going to go. And when I knew what was going on, I sort of still didn't know what was going on, which, you know, for the most part of the film, wasn't a bad thing. And I was watching this film with my brother. I'm currently in Ireland and we generally watch the film review films together when I'm at home. So we spent a lot of the film going, what's going on? Do you think this is happening? Do you think he's doing this? Do you think she did this? Do you think he's doing this because of this? Which is quite a fun thing when you're watching a horror film in the middle of the day. Sean Harris is in this film and Sean Harris was also in Possum, which I watched and reviewed recently, which traumatised me. And Sean Harris, I would just like to say that if you are listening, um, thank you for traumatising me twice in the last while because Sean Harris's character absolutely traumatised me in this film and in Possum. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what they were going for. So well done. But I know that if I ever met Sean Harris or even saw him in real life, I would be, I'd feel, I'd feel a little bit scared of him. I'd feel a little bit, I'd be judgmental. I'd be suspicious. And now on to the dislikes. Listen, right, I have to say if, if you are somebody who has suffered any sort of sexual violence, do a cursory does the dog die search for this film because there was a moment in this film and when I posted on Instagram that this was the film I was doing this week, somebody posted that there was a moment in the film that that absolutely traumatised them, right? So I was thinking to myself, when is this moment going to be? And oh, oh, when it happened, when it happened, it 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 happened. I was not okay. I it was hideously violent. It honestly made my legs go to jelly. Apps like I was so wibbly wobbly wonder after watching that scene. Honest to Christ, I was like, oh no, it was such a shock, and I was not expecting it. And even the whole the whole build up to the particular incident, I was not expecting it either. So just to say, do it does the dog die for this for this film? Because that moment for a lot of people might be very, very, very difficult to watch. I feel like the acting from the leading woman was very subpar. And it annoyed me at times because it let the film down, I think. I'd imagine it was relatively low budget. I actually haven't looked that up at the time of recording this, but it was well filmed. It was clever. It used its, you know, its setting really, really well. But she, I just didn't think she was very good. I thought her character, her character just annoyed me. And I got to the point in the film where the characters were making such ridiculous decisions that... I couldn't really take it seriously anymore and I know it's a horror film I know it's not set in reality you know we have to suspend our disbelief when we're watching horror films but they're still human beings and they're still making absolutely outrageous decisions to a point where I sort of felt like do you know what do you deserve to get eaten by rats kind of is it a good idea really to go deeper into the London Underground along the train tracks where there are live trains? Probably not a good idea, but are you still going to do it? Apparently, yes. And the ambiguity of the film, which I really enjoyed in the beginning, I thought, oh, I don't know what's going on. I don't know who the aggressor is. This is interesting. I did not like by the end. If I had not watched this film with my brother, I genuinely would have assumed that I missed a big chunk of it because I got to the end and I didn't really understand what the hell was happening. And I I thought, hang on, have I missed a bit here? Because I don't know where this antagonist came from. It's alluded to, I mean, heavily, but it's still kind of confusing. I just thought it could have been clearer. You know, I think you need to make a decision when you're making a film like this. You either keep it completely ambiguous and you don't give the audience any understanding of where this character has come from or you try and explain the backstory a little bit better. And this film fell into that fatal trap where I saw way too much of that creature. 
you know, got to the point where I was like, oh, he's back again. Oh, yeah, there he is. Our old pal, Craig. Just wasn't, I wasn't bothered by him eventually. And I think actually it would have been a lot more effective if he was kept in the shadows for a lot longer. So I don't really know what to give this film out of five. I feel like it's a three, to be honest. It has its flaws, definitely. I think it leans heavily into sexual violence against women, which I I don't, don't think it was any sort of statement. I think it was just for shock factor, which I personally didn't like. Again, my dislike of gore and that level of violence is really subjective. And I understand that other people, it wouldn't bother them at all. But for me, wasn't I wasn't into it. it. It made me very uncomfortable. I think the premise of the story was great. I think the premise of the movie itself was great. Was I that impressed by it? No, I think I was a bit disappointed. However, for entertainment value and for the originality of the story, I think it's probably worth a watch. So I'm going to give it three out of five. Today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Welcome back, everyone. So good to see you all back again this week. It is such a shame that Chupacabra couldn't make it. But given the reports this week that he is, in fact, a dog, perhaps Monsters Anonymous is not the best place for him. Now, today, we're going to recap on what we learned last week, which was... That's right! Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. You guys were really paying attention. So how can we use Hello Fresh as a great alternative to hunting and consuming humans? You've all got New Year's goals and Hello Fresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and skip that eternal rat race of hunting humans and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your cave without all of the worry of being caught on camera and put in a paranormal YouTube compilation. Okay, okay, Mothman. Mothman. I appreciate your contribution, but remember last week? We talked about using our indoor voices or indoor echolocation. You are very loud in this small space also please keep the death prophecies to the end of the session as it upsets the other entities thank you let's continue with hello fresh eating well in the new year can be stress-free and delicious with over 35 weekly recipes they have the options that you're looking for to help you achieve those goals choose calorie smart and carb smart recipes or even customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides upgrading your proteins or adding protein that isn't human to a veggie dish also i'd like to think i wasn't this patronizing as a teacher but i probably was and i can tell you that i have received a whopping 89 hello fresh boxes thus far and i love it helps me to eat better save money limit my food waste etc okay bigfoot bigfoot i love that you are trying really hard But I'm going to go ahead and ask you to remove my leg from your mouth, okay? Some people are into it, not me. Why don't you use that energy to go to HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use code RealLifeGhostStories22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Now, everybody say it with me. That's HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories and use code RealLifeGhostStories22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Welcome to Breeze Line, where the sky's the limit thanks to better internet. With lightning fast speeds up to one gig, you can game like a boss, stream like a pro, and watch like there's no tomorrow. Stream, watch, post, send, and trend. Do it all with our fiber-powered network bringing you reliable, fast internet. Welcome to Breeze Line. Visit BreezeLine.com for latest offers. Service subject to availability. New customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for details. Which brings us to our stories this week. Now I need to give a bit of a, a bit of a, a backstory as to why I've decided to do this story this week, or rather these stories this week. Firstly, I'm currently in Ireland. I'm currently recording this in my sister's sitting room. So if there's any noise variations or sound variations, that is what it is. I also decided that because I'm in Ireland this week and it has been a pretty crazy week, that I would do a compilation of stories. One of the things that we talk about all the time on this podcast is 
how incredibly terrifying children are. And they are incredibly terrifying. And when I was reading my TikTok comments last week, I think it was, somebody commented, I'm surprised you haven't done the story of Purple Mommy. Now, I'm not going to lie. I thought it was a sex thing. I've been caught out with that before where I've looked up something that somebody's mentioned in a comment and I my eyes have been burned out of my, my eye holes. But Purple Mommy is not a sex thing. It is a story about an imaginary friend. And I thought, oh, it's been a while since I've done a compilation of stories. And this week, I've spent a lot of time in the vicinity of small children. I am currently looking after my sister children for a couple of days. And you know what? It's like having tiny zombies around the house. It's like having having like tiny horror movie monsters all the time. There's just handprints everywhere. Everything is just a little bit sticky around the house. The minute they go to bed, I'm like tiptoeing around the house, terrified that my any tiny noise will set them off. So I decided for today, we are going to do a compilation of the creepiest imaginary friend stories from small children that I could find. And the link to where I found all of these stories will be in the description of this episode. So let's get into it. When I was six years old, we lived in an old farmhouse that was at the very edge of a small village in the Midwest. My bedroom was on the second floor and the closet had a very heavy wooden door. The latch was old and rusted, which my mom didn't think was safe, so we didn't use that closet for anything. Well, I started sitting in the closet at night with the light on, talking to a nice old man who hung out in there. He wore a blue uniform, had salt and pepper hair and a moustache, I had a name for him and everything. It was Maypole. I talked to this nice old man about my life, my family, my friends, school, everything. This went on for about a year. My mom found out about it, forbade me from going back in the closet and told me to knock it off with the imaginary friend because it was freaking my little brother out. Fast forward several years. There was a town meeting to elect a new mayor for the village and everyone was supposed to attend. My mom brought my brothers and I with her because she couldn't find a babysitter. At the little town hall, which I had never stepped foot in before that night, there was a photo memorial plaque on the wall for a mailman who had been hit and killed by a truck delivering mail to the end of the road that I lived on. His name was Ralph Maypole and he looked exactly the same as my imaginary friend blue uniform and all we're starting out strong it's a big (laughs) it's a big old story to start I mean kudos to them to the mom in this story for being like stay out of the closet and stop with your imaginary friend shit okay just give it a rest I cannot be dealing with it you're freaking the other children out so can you not do that It does make me question a lot of things, stories like this. They're so frequent, they're so widespread. And in the episode last week, The Third Man Factor, we talked about how I think it was 30% of children have an imaginary friend for a period of, you know, anywhere between six months to maybe a year or so, whatever it was. And then eventually they grow out of it or the imaginary friend disappears, you know, for whatever reason. And regularly these imaginary friends are people who have passed away. And that's that's a that's something that comes up all the time. That is not me exaggerating. But regularly these imaginary friends are people who have passed away. I'd love for there to be some sort of study where they try and analyse that of that 30% of children who have imaginary friends, like how many of them are relatives who have passed away? Or how many of them are, you know, ridiculous creatures that they fantasize about and the reality is that in that in that research they realized that these children do not believe that these are imaginary friends these children believe that these are real people and they don't don't think they've conjured them up in their own brain like they don't think they've created them they're not going oh yeah no this is just a make-believe friend they think this is a real friend and it honestly makes me wonder like what if these children can see spirits of people that have passed on and because these children can see them the spirits hang around with these children 
Hence the the little boy chitter chattering to this nice old man called Maypo about his life and school and his friends and blah 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 because he's not thinking anything different of it. This little boy is just thinking, oh, this is just the man that lives in my closet and he listens to me when I tell him loads of cool stuff. Is it possible that this little boy actually had seen a picture of this man before and then created a whole personality or world around him or maybe he had seen you know some pictures of male men and then when he saw the picture of Ralph Maypole he thought that that was him or assumed that it was him but it's the name that name is so specific and relatively unusual if he was like oh it's just Mr. Postman and then he saw a picture of a postman you'd be like "Mm, well maybe but his name was Ralph Maypole I wonder did he tell his mom at that point I wonder did he go, oh my God, mom, that's the man I've been seeing in the closet. Because let me tell you, if she was cross when she first found out, (laughs) she's going to be like, listen, I'm not having you around. If you're going to be freaking out your brothers, chatting shit with the ghost in the closet, I'm not doing it. And our second story today is the story that inspired this entire episode, which comes from the user Professor Dog. And like I said, all the links to where I got these stories will be in the description of this episode. When my son was first learning to talk, he would tell us about something called Purple Mommy. He described Purple Mommy as all purple, with long hair and bright all-white eyes. At the time, he was mixing up purple with black a lot, so he could have meant she was all black and shadowy. Purple Mommy would pick him up at night and turn off the lights. This creeped me out as we would often find my son out of his crib in the morning which would mean him crawling over the railing and to the ground at a time when he was barely walking. I definitely found the lights in his room off a few times too even though he's terrified of the dark. He also explained that Purple Mommy needed bandages because she had blood everywhere. Purple Mommy could take her head off and finally Purple Mommy really didn't like Daddy. He told us all of this stuff for maybe a year or a little more. If we ever asked where she was, he would always point to the same spot. A corner of the room behind his open closet door. He woke up crying almost every night during this time and once during a really rough night, my wife went to ask him what was wrong and his answer was, Purple Mommy won't let me sleep. While people are researching, kids and their imaginary friends etc etc can you also do some research into why all of these ghosts are hanging around in closets what is going on there and that's not a rhetorical question like I want the answer to that if anybody has any ideas out there as to why these ghosts so often appear in cupboards or in closets in bedrooms can you let me know please that would be very helpful and it would answer a lot of questions In terms of the child being out of his crib in the morning, I think sometimes we do underestimate how agile children are sometimes and we underestimate what their mobility abilities are when they're at a young age. Now, I'm not a parent, so, you know, I'm saying that from my experience with a million nieces and nephews. But to give an example, one of my nieces was making her way out of her cot and her mom couldn't understand it and then one day (laughs) her mom sent me a video where she had caught her daughter flinging herself out of the crib and you know what it was actually it was one of those things where it was weirdly both demonstrative of incredible agility but also a complete disregard for her own personal safety and I don't know how she managed to do it every time without hurting herself but that's what she was doing and I think sometimes we underestimate those those kids and what they're able to do. Maybe I'm just telling myself that because I don't want to think of the possibility of Purple Mommy carrying the child out of the cot. Purple Mommy, who's covered in blood and hangs out in the closet and has all white eyes, you know? And our next story comes from Uwu Senpai Satan. I had an imaginary friend named Derek, who was a carbon copy of me. We were completely identical. I played with Derek for years, longer than what normal kids do. 
but he would always look at my mom and my older sister with a sense of sadness. Eventually, he went away. 23 years later, I was digging through my mom's safe to grab some paperwork she'd kept for me, and I found a stillborn death certificate for a boy named Derek who shared my birthday. It was only then that I discovered I was actually a twin, and my brother Derek died during birth. I found that story so sad, almost almost harrowing. Like, was this child telling his mum and his sisters all the time when he was growing up, oh, I'm just playing with Derek, and me and Derek are playing, and etc, etc. And the mum obviously was never able to tell him and I understand that. Maybe it was too difficult. Maybe it was too painful. Maybe she didn't want the questions. Maybe she didn't need the questions. Maybe she wanted to wait until he was older and the time never arose. Whatever her reasons for not telling him, she chose not to tell him. And it's important to respect that. But did she then spend his whole life or for that period of time listening to him playing with Derek and talking about Derek and saying that Derek was identical to him or Did he just not talk about it and think it was normal so he didn't talk about it? Because how difficult would that have been for her having to hear him talk about Derek all the time and thinking to herself, how does he know? Did somebody tell him or is he really seeing his twin who passed away? And we've talked regularly about twins having a strange bond. And generally when I talk about it, more twins will pop up and message me and say, hey, yeah, this happens to me and my twin. We can feel each other's pain or we know when each other's in trouble or we know what each other's thinking. And I do think that maybe twins have this bond that is sometimes stronger than siblings that aren't twins. I don't know. So maybe this is just another example of that bond. And story number four comes from Not Another Whatever. My sister Ashley used to get visited at night by a dead girl with long, dark hair and spider hands. Yes, this predated the ring, and yes, I'm old as fuck. Anyway, she moved out the second she turned 18 and never looked back. Twenty-odd years later, our half-brother Trevor moved into her old room. It wasn't long after that that Trevor started sleeping on the sofa or with the lights on, and told us about his new friend that he didn't like. She was a dead girl, who had long dark hair, an old nightgown, and spider hands. Needless to say, none of us offered to trade rooms with him. Somebody explain to me what spider hands means. Does that mean she has long spider leg fingers? Does that mean her hands are like spiders like the body and legs of a spider does that mean she has little spider hands like when you see ultra close-ups of spiders and they have tiny little fingers at the end of their long little legs anyway i'm not entirely sure why i'm being pedantic about the description of spider hands because whatever way you look at it whether it is hands made of spiders or long spider fingers it is horrific and to think that there is 20 years between these two incidents that this girl was regularly visited by this dead girl with long dark hair and spider hands and then 20 whatever years later the half brother had the same experience i mean is this a case of the power of suggestion you know was this a conversation that they had within the family like oh do you remember that time that ashley used to have all that weird stuff happening in her bedroom and Then when she moved out, it all stopped. And then obviously Trevor moves into the bedroom and he starts experiencing weird stuff in the bedroom as well. You know, is it possible that it was just the power of suggestion? And I don't mean just the power of suggestion because we know how powerful a placebo effect is. So if you say to somebody, you are going to see in this room a dead girl with long black hair and spider hands... Are you then more likely to see that or have sleep paralysis relating to that or have nightmares relating to that and therefore you're not able to stay in the room anymore, you know? I think sometimes like how we underestimate the mobility and agility of children sometimes and of course their failure to have any concept of danger, 
We also underestimate the power of suggestion and how long our memories actually are. Maybe it was just a fleeting conversation all about a weird family event and then it burred its way down into the half-brother's brain and it resurfaced when he moved into that bedroom. Who knows? And story number five comes from Pax Lena. One of my uncles, Steve, lost a childhood friend when he was around seven years old. Steve and his friend Jack were having a play date one afternoon and got a bit dirty in some mud. So Steve's mother gave Jack a pair of Steve's shoes to borrow. When Jack's father came to pick him up after the play date, he forgot to put his shoes back on so he accidentally got into the car still wearing Steve's boots. Tragically, the father and Jack got into a terrible crash on the way home which killed seven-year-old Jack. The family had him buried in the shoes he had borrowed from Steve. Fast forward 30 years. It's 2010 and we were at a family gathering. My six-year-old cousin Sarah was alone playing with her toys in a quieter room of the house. My uncle Steve went up to her and asked her what she was playing. Sarah responded saying that she was playing with a friend. Holding back a smile, Steve asked her who her imaginary friend was. She explained that she was playing with his friend Jack, adding, He's sorry he forgot to give you your shoes back. My uncle's jaw nearly dropped. He had not talked about Jack in years, let alone told that story to a six-year-old. No one had brought up Jack that day, nor at any family gathering recently. Every time I remember this incident, I get chills. Oh, the absolute innocence of it kills me and on all counts the innocence of the little boy in the shoes losing his life in that accident and then the innocence of the little girl saying I'm just playing with my friend and he's sorry that he forgot to give you your shoes back and if I was Steve at that point I would have fallen out of my shoes with the shock again though and I'm not trying to be like super skeptical and annoying because that's not why we're here however Is it possible that actually somebody did have that conversation in front of that little girl and she retained that information because she was six years old and kids are like tiny creepy sponges. They just absorb all the information all around them and then regurgitate it back at the most inopportune or opportune moments and scare the living daylights out of everybody around them. And story number six comes from LibriBot. My son, then about two or three years old, used to tell us about his imaginary friend, Johnny, who wore all green, including a green hat. Once we were driving by the cemetery and my son pointed out the window and exclaimed, that's where Johnny lives. He was very little and didn't know what a cemetery was. So we explained to him that no one lives there and that it's a place for people who died. That's when he told us that Johnny lived there because he was a soldier who died in a place called Nam. I would crash the car and I would be (laughs) dead and buried in that same cemetery because I would not be able to deal with the fact that my offspring is here talking to dead soldiers from Vietnam. Again though, is it possible that these kids are seeing some sort of I don't know, news report, maybe a glimpse of a film and maybe retained some of that information. I mean, two or three years old is very, it's very young, but, you know, the kids are starting to, at that point, talk in full sentences and remember things and retain information and have conversations about things. So is it possible that they had just absorbed some of that information from, you know, TV or film or something and then was regurgitating it at opportune moments? And maybe that that's where Johnny lives was a coincidence. It's weird to say that as they were driving by the cemetery though. Like how is that the moment the child chooses to go? That's that's where Johnny lives and he died in a place called Nam. I think at the surface of it I wouldn't engage with it. But behind the scenes I would very quietly be looking up family history of people who died while serving. And also local history of people who died in conflict because I'd kind of I'd want to know 
But the problem is, is that even if you did find out, you don't, there is really no way of verifying whether or not your child has an imaginary friend or whether or not their imaginary friend is a real soldier who died in Vietnam. And much and all, as I love to don my white coat and take out my science spectacles, I'm not entirely sure that even me as a paranormal expert could verify that. And the next story comes from Songbird563. My son stopped talking to his imaginary friend for months after my nephew, who was 15, took his own life. My son, who was not quite five, was the apple of his eye. My nephew treated my son like a little brother, and since his mom watched my son while I worked, they spent tons of time together. I had simply told my son that his cousin was sick from sadness and he had died. I would remind him every time before we went to their house that he wouldn't pester my sister about where he was. One day he said, Mom, you keep saying that he's not here anymore, but he is. He sits on my bed before I go to sleep and he talks to me. He would not be dissuaded. This went on for months. He knew things that happened that we did not speak about around him. My nephew's grandpa on his dad's side passed a few months later and that's when my son told me his cousin told him he wouldn't be able to visit anymore. He was going on a train with his grandpa and they couldn't come back again. The last thing he told him was never to play with guns. They weren't safe. My nephew took his life with a handgun. It wigged me the hell out. So let's assume for a minute that the nephew was indeed coming back to the little boy to talk to him and chat to him and sit at the end of the bed and, you know, comfort him before he went to sleep because they had this really close bond when when the nephew was alive. It's the train bit that really makes me emotional and I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's the two people, the two family members being united together and taking that journey to wherever it was they were going together. And perhaps, perhaps it's not that literal. Perhaps it's a case of trying to explain to the child in terms that he would understand. We are going on a journey. We are going on a train together and we're not going to be coming back again. Maybe that's the easiest way to explain it to a little one. And the next story comes from Mother of Squid. My bedroom was in the attic. When my brother was four, he told me about the man who lived in the attic. Apparently, he would hear someone walking around in the attic when I wasn't in there. He said he had seen someone's head poking out of the hatch watching him at night, and that he was sorry he had been too scared to do anything about the man in my bedroom. If that wasn't bad enough, one time I was hanging out in his room one day, and he went quiet out of nowhere, and when I asked what was wrong, he said, He's back. And I swear to God I heard footsteps coming from the attic. I no longer live with them. I was talking to the same brother, now aged 10, about him taking the bigger attic bedroom now that it's empty. My youngest brother, who's five, immediately answered, But where will the man live? There is a simple answer to that question. And that is anywhere except the attic in our house. I'd be like, that man can live anywhere else. He doesn't need to be hanging around in, in the attic bedroom, in a child's attic bedroom. Go somewhere else. It's interesting that the younger kids seemed to hear the footsteps and talk about the man in the attic um, and seeing the head poking out of the hatch watching him at night. That's traumatising. That's horrendous. That is honestly not what you'd want to be hearing from a child. And as I was reading that story, some debris or you know soot or whatever fell from the chimney into the fireplace and frightened the life out of me. I wonder if that's the only time though that the original poster of this story heard footsteps in the attic bedroom when the little boy was saying he's back. Was that the only time that they heard footsteps or did weird things happen otherwise that maybe they wouldn't have noticed or didn't attribute to the man in the attic bedroom was there actually a man who was living in the attic? Like, I'm not being funny, but we hear those stories all the time. 
about people living in attics. I read this horrendous one while I was looking for stories for this episode and honestly it was terrifying. It was like Kimberly's story but real life. This boy who you know realized when he was um, a child that he could sneak downstairs in the middle of the night if he woke up and eat any of the food that he wanted and nobody would really notice and he went downstairs one night really quietly and went into the kitchen and there was just a man in the kitchen who was eating food and then he ran back upstairs and told his mom and dad and they couldn't find this man thought he was dreaming and then he kind of noticed that little bits of food would go missing etc etc and eventually he saw somebody watching him through the vents in his bedroom again everyone thought he was being dramatic or everyone thought that he was overreacting until the smell happened and it turned out that a man had been living in their attic crawl space and had passed away up there and he had been seeing this man watching him through the vents and honestly it was such a scary story to read because it wasn't paranormal at all I started out with me thinking that it might be paranormal, then it wasn't, then it was just worse than paranormal. And I have one final story for you today from Jake underscore Kiger. Let's get into it. When my daughter was really young, she had an imaginary friend named Dee Dee. If she'd wake up in the middle of the night, she would strip her bed and build a pile of her blankets and pillows in our room and wake up in her nest. When she was five years old, we moved into our new house, built in the late 1800s by cattle rancher, Jessie Driscoll. In the new house, she started building the piles in her own room, but she'd wake up on her stripped bed. When asked, she insisted that the nest was for her friend Rose. We asked her if Rose was friends with Dee Dee, and she'd say, no, Rose is real. She would tell us about Rose waking her up in the night and wanting to rest, so she'd build a nest for her on the floor and go back to bed. Years later, a sweet old neighbour and grandniece of the Driscoll family told us that Jessie had a first wife, who died in the house of sepsis poisoning, and her name was Rose. Who is this little kid building a nest? I'd be absolutely livid. One of my pet peeves one of the worst jobs i believe in a household is dressing the bed i absolutely despise it i love the feeling of getting into fresh bedding it makes me really happy but honestly i despise doing it i loathe it so if my child was getting up every night and making a nest out of her blankets and stripping her bed and all uh, i that's enough for me to give her a drop kicking down the stairs. I'm sorry to say it. All of the paranormal stuff aside, this this that that would be the final straw for me. Building nests in your bedroom and then building nests for your ghost friend is infinitely worse. So there's a lot going on here, you know. And I think fundamentally if we've learned anything from today's episode, it's that kids are indeed little creeps. Much like the title of this week's film review, I have also learned that I have the utmost respect for anybody out there who is looking after small children in whatever capacity, because it is bloody hard work. They're always just sort of there, just sort of there hanging around, needing things, you know, needing to be fed and looked after. And it's it's a lot of work. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Thank you so much for your patience with two things. Firstly, that it's a compilation episode. It has made life infinitely easier for me this week to have a compilation episode. But equally, thank you for having patience with my very much soft, quiet indoor voice while the children are sleeping because I am petrified that they are going to wake up and therefore I will have to tend to their needs. If you would like to send in your story, you can email it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. If you are desperate for extra content, you can sign up to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash reallifeghoststories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.
Welcome to BreezeLine, where the sky's the limit thanks to better internet. With lightning fast speeds up to one gig, you can game like a boss, stream like a pro, and watch like there's no tomorrow. Stream, watch, post, send, and trend. Do it all with our fiber-powered network, bringing you reliable, fast internet. Welcome to BreezeLine. Visit BreezeLine.com for latest offers. Service subject to availability. New customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for details.